Welcome to Puro Politics, the political podcast of the San Antonio Express News. My name is Gilbert Garcia, Metro columnist, and I'm joined today by City Hall reporter Joshua Fector, business editor and columnist Greg Jefferson, reporter Brian Chasnoff. Got a lot going on both locally uh, and and nationally uh, as we as we start the podcast today. We're recording this on Monday. Uh, June fifteenth. This morning, we just learned there was a major uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision um, addressing the issue of of sex discrimination as it applies to LGBTQ individuals. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, ruled in a six to three vote that the nineteen sixty four Civil Rights Act that the the, the uh, sex discrimination protections that were in there to protect people from from losing their jobs um, w- also do apply to members of the LGBT. LGBTQ community. There was a, a majority decision written by Neil Gorsuch, who was a 2017 appointee of, of Donald Trump's, and um, I think it's it's a it's clearly a major victory uh, for uh, members of the LGBTQ community, and uh, a, a decision that I think is going to have really major impacts because it really it it offers protection on a federal level. I think we've had different. Um, standards in different in different parts of the country and then now we're, we've got we're gonna have like federal protections for 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 people uh regarding workplace uh discrimination i wanted to get to the issue uh some local issues with uh particularly police reform which is you know this is a national um you know issue at at, at the moment because of the um all the um you know the the questions that have come up and and just the uh, the anger really that's come up over the the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis by a Minneapolis police officer three weeks ago. We've seen, uh, you know, uh, protests that are you know continuing and a, a lot of uh, examples of, of states and, and local communities making changes in the way that they they handle policing. And last week we had uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg talking about. Uh, his desire to see, you know, police reform in San Antonio. And Josh, this is something you've been covering. And I was, I was curious, how, how specific is the mayor being at this, uh, you know, right now when it comes to the changes that he'd like to see uh, in, in uh, policing in San Antonio? Well, so far he hasn't laid out any kind of, you know, real specifics about what he would like to see. Uh, it's notable um, that, uh, you know, he is, he's basically looking at, uh, a couple of areas though, kind of broadly. One is that he wants, uh, changes to the, to the police unions contract that, that deals with, you know, uh, disciplinary issues. Mm. Uh, he also, uh, wants to basically reevaluate, you know, how much the city spends on policing. Um, and in, in that respect, he's, he's joined by at least seven city council members by my count who are, who have said that they're open to re-examining how much, uh, you know, San Antonio spends on policing. And, uh, you know, last week the mayor kind of unveiled this, this kind of loose agenda on, you know, how the city should go about tackling police reform. Part of it has to do with the collective bargaining unit. Uh, but then he also, charged you know three council committees to to look into issues like police use of force mental health um you know figuring out like what the city's agenda at the state capitol needs to be in regards to you know the power of public safety unions and officer discipline so it's a it's a pretty wide net right now with not a lot of specifics um yeah but you're you're sort of seeing you know at at sort of the 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 highest levels of city government between, you know, the mayor, city manager, Eric Walsh, um, and the police chief, you know, William McManus, uh, that, you know, maybe that role of the police department does need to be reexamined. Yeah, yeah, um, and, you know, the, the, the police union contract is one that, you know, we've talked about a lot because it does, you know, it, it does offer protections for police officers when it comes to the issues of, of accountability. It, it, it's, it's, um, you know, it limits how you know how much time the police department has to investigate uh, allegations of police misconduct. It uh, limits their ability to, or arbitrators' ability to look at you know past examples of, of uh, you know police misconduct. And so that's one thing that's come up. One 
in 2016, when the, the, the contract was signed, uh, we had Ray Saldana, the council, then a council member, uh, bring up all these issues, but he, they came up kind of late in the game after a, a, an agreement had been reached. And, um, what I'm wondering yeah. is going forward, do, is, do you sense that there's more of a proactive approach at this time that, that Nuremberg and others on the council are determined to lay out before they, before the, the, the bargaining begins to say, these are things that we're going to have to have in the contract. Right. And part of, part of what he, he did last week was push council uh, to adopt the resolution. It hasn't been adopted yet, uh, but to adopt the resolution, basically laying out those priorities and, you know, at least, um, at least two council members of, of Roberto Trevino and Ana Sandoval have said that they're not going to vote uh, on a police contract that doesn't address those issues. Mm-hmm. I would expect the mayor uh, would also vote against a contract uh, that that uh, doesn't deal with yeah. some of these disciplinary issues. Uh, but then the the other thing I should note is that you know one of the things that he's uh, asking council to do is to basically make sure um, you know in terms of a a specific uh, that SAPD adopts policies uh, from the it can't wait initiative Uh, that's Mm -hmm. uh, basically that's a a set of uh, policies that are put forth by this uh, non-profit campaign zero that's sort of geared at police reform to basically reduce police violence Uh, you know Chief McManus has said that pretty much the city abides by all of those, but there are a lot of uh, sort of exceptions uh, to that and some some tricky parts of the language. So that's yeah. going to be something that public safety is going to be looking at going forward. Hey, Brian. Yeah, hey, we, we, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to ask Josh. I mean, I'm really curious. You know, obviously, when, you know, when you talk about police reform, it kind of breaks down into two tracks. One, you know, at least in San Antonio, like the the way you can handle it, through uh, through collective bargaining with the police union, and that gets at police reform. But when we talk about you know defunding the police, I mean that's really it's more of a budgetary thing, and you're talking about taking taking tax dollars and kind of spreading it around uh, to you know m- more social service agencies, taking some of the functions away from the police department. Do you get right. the feeling like is there any appetite? among council members for really addressing that in the next budget? I mean, because, you know, the city staff should be putting together kind of the outlines of next year's budget, like right now. Is that going to be, is that going to be part of the debate? Well, yeah, you're going to, well, first, first and foremost, we're going to see basically the, uh, the broad outlines of, you know, the budget starting to to sort of percolate this week um, on Thursday city staff's going to present basically a, a first draft of a budget um, so I, I do expect there to be a lot of discussions about that going forward during this budget season uh, you know as, as I mentioned before there were like you know seven city council mm-hmm. members that I talked to who who all expressed some level of curiosity about about you know basically spreading out the uh the responsibility is like you know mental health domestic violence mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. you know among you know cities uh departments that don't necessarily carry a gun uh then uh but you know you've also got uh to consider that there's also a a pandemic going on that sort of cratered the the city budget uh, mm-hmm. to a certain degree. So like how much of, you know, if, if there are going to be cuts, where are they going to be? That's, um, so you've got like basically these two forces that are intersecting, uh, on Thursday. So it'll be interesting to see where, how, where, and how they actually make those cuts. Um, but you know, the other thing that, that occurs to me is that, you know, there was an editorial board meeting at the express news on Friday Right. And, you know, city manager Eric Walsh was on that and he said, look, you know, we can make changes to this year's budget, but like this is probably this isn't going to be like a one year thing. Like we're going to have to talk about this like every single mm-hmm. time we put together a budget like this is going to be a long term thing if we're serious about, you know, re reevaluating like what the police department looks like. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, Brian, you uh, I think when the. Uh- Chief McManus came to the editorial board. I know you got a chance to ask him some questions. And is yeah. it your sense that he 
his big focus is the contract um, or are there administrative actions that he is talk that he sees that, yeah, that, that he that, could, he could take. Real, that's a real important distinction to make. And I think it, I think it's important, first of all, to recognize that chief McManus can make all the administrative, uh, you know, decisions and changes mm-hmm. that he wants to make. Uh, and, and none of it, it, it matters very little when you have a contract in which officers can escape accountability for violating those rules. Right. So I, th- I think there's a recognition at the top level of city government by the city manager, by the police chief, but, and also very much by the mayor that changes to the contract, uh, specifically the disciplinary process, uh, contained in, in the contract, uh, th- that needs to take precedence. Uh, it, 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 it's a, it's an integral part of reform. Right. You can't really have reform without fixing that problem because as y'all mentioned earlier in the podcast, you know, you have this 180 day statute of limitations basically where on the 181st day after, after, a, a, an incident of misconduct, uh, you you can't even punish the officer for yeah. it because that that time frame has elapsed. And then, as you mentioned, Gilbert, uh, there's there's also limitations to what the arbitrators can consider when they come in and and look at the uh, the they they can't go back more than a couple years, uh, even if officers were suspended for serious misconduct right. in the past. So, one one of the things that that I think shocked people about the the George Floyd. Um, video where you had an officer putting his his knee on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes was the fact that you had three other officers who just stood by and did nothing. And and I think this has been uh, an issue for a long time with regarding police brutality that you that you have this environment or culture within the police department in which other officers sort of uh, allow this to happen and don't don't speak out. And so one of the big uh, subjects that has come up in recent weeks has been the uh, police departments requiring that officers intervene uh, if there's another officer who's doing something they shouldn't be doing. And my understanding is that San Antonio does have that kind of requirement. Is that right? The, yes. The, the, there's, right. Yeah. yeah it's McManus part of the, the saying, eight can't wait. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. McManus is saying that they, that SAPD essentially, you know, in substance fulfills all eight of those reforms with the, with the exception of, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but with the exception of shooting at moving vehicles, right? Uh, there, there are a couple of exceptions. That's 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 one of them. Um, you know, they've got four where they're basically they, like McManus is basically saying we we abide by all of them. There's just a question of like amending the language um, yeah. because they're not. It's not quite aligned with campaigns era. I mean, it's basically like sort sort of like a just a matter of semantics is, is what he's chalking it up to. Like they ban chalk uh, choke holds, but, but there's an exception if, if, if the life is in, in threatened or something, those kinds of things. Is that, is that what they're talking about? Right. Those kind of exceptions. Yeah. Although, um, although uh, that uh, SAPD policy on choke holds apparently is in line with campaign zeros. Oh, okay. uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, I went to get to, um, uh, the issue of the 2020 Republican National Convention. A couple of weeks ago, Brian and I were talking about the fact that on our first podcast two years ago, um, the main thing that we talked about was should the Republican uh, National Convention come to San Antonio and the controversy over the fact that uh, Ron Nuremberg didn't want to uh, have the city bid on it. And last week, that issue flared up again because um, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. The, the you had the the uh, the governor who was a Democrat saying that he didn't want to have big arena events, uh, full scale convention events in Charlotte because of concerns about COVID nineteen, and so Donald Trump uh, decided that he wanted to move at least the big uh, splashy events from the convention, his acceptance speech, and so on, somewhere else. And uh, last, uh, I guess it was weekend before last. We had uh, we had uh, Cassandra Mate from Visit San Antonio, um, basically uh, pushing the idea of of San Antonio getting getting in the mix and maybe uh, putting in a bid um, for the convention. And it, it, this this whole thing played out very fast and it was over pretty fast. But Josh, you wrote about it. Yeah. What happened there? So 
what happened was, you know, last weekend, as all of this sort of becomes clear that it's it's that the Republican National Convention is not going to stay uh, uh, in Charlottesville, uh, that, you know, it's, hey, look, like, perhaps we have an opportunity here to sort of uh, cast our hat in the ring here. Uh, Cassandra Mate, uh, the head of Visit San Antonio, which is basically, you know, the uh, the city's tourism marketing agency, you right. know, simply sort of sent a letter to city manager Eric Walsh asking, hey, uh, do we want to take another look at this? Uh, you know, acting sort of at the behest of, you know, sort of unnamed San Antonio business leaders, but we can safely assume that they're in the hospitality industry, uh, which has been hit pretty hard by the pandemic. And, you know, sure pretty quickly like it was you know this this thing sort of came to light on tuesday and like by the afternoon it had been totally deflated um because you know that's when word was starting to leak out that in fact jacksonville florida got it um but i mean it it did sort of like revive a lot of sort of uh hurt feelings about (laughs) about the uh about the convention and how it was decided not to bid on it last time, you know, it was done behind mm-hmm. closed doors. But, you know, the, like the thinking was, is that city's tourism industry has been hit really hard by the pandemic and that, you know, having a convention come in with 20,000 attendees and, you know, generated, yeah. you know, 50 million in local spending uh, would go a long way towards, uh, you know, getting it back on its feet. Hey, yeah, actually, Greg, I mean, you can kind of, I mean, you can kind of look at, at, her her proposal her her memo to uh to eric walsh as a sign of just how desperate uh mm-hmm. the hospitality industry is in san antonio i mean because it's not like the politics have have changed much over the last two years if anything they've hardened i mean you know the the, right. the you know especially given uh you know trump's anti-immigrant stance you know, feelings have only have only uh, you know gotten gotten more intense over that time. So politically, it was a non-starter uh, that she would even propose it. Yeah. Just kind of speaks to just how desperate uh, you know hotels, restaurants, and bars are downtown. Yeah, and and like two years ago, where you had the site selection committee chair from the Republican party actually, you know, coming to San Antonio and really seeing, seeming, uh, very interested. I mean, I, th- I think he really wanted San Antonio. Um, and this time th- I don't think there had really been any overtures from the party or anything. I think she was just kind of trying to jumpstart something. Um, mm. and, and, you know, and as you said, I mean, the, 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 the political, uh, divisions have hardened and then plus we had the COVID-19 uh, question. So, which would, I think would have complicated any, any big event, um, in, in San yeah, Antonio. Yeah, that was something that, that- yeah, that was something that, uh, you know, County Judge Nelson Wolf was saying, you know, he was a proponent of of bringing the RNC here um, a couple of years ago. But now, you know, what he told me was like, look, like the president's going to flout any sort of, uh, you know, requirements or recommendations on masks. Right. He's he's not into that. And, you know, neither are his followers like that would be a gigantic health risk if we were to bring them here. Yeah. And I think one of one of the things that it, it's really gotten harder for I think, both parties to 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 uh, get cities on board for conventions because they're they're much more polarizing than, than they used to be. I think cities just used to look at conventions as this is just good for business. And um, and I think the Republicans are, are particularly having our time. And it's I, we have so many big city mayors that are Democrats in in if not in name, in fact. And so I think I, I felt like Jacksonville, this is one of the few big cities that has a Republican mayor. And it's, you know, that's, I think that was a key factor because you're just going to have a lot of mayors who don't want to get on board with this. I, I, the last thing I want to talk about, and uh, Josh, you were talking about uh, Nelson Wolf and COVID-19. And along those lines, he uh, sent a really interesting letter the other day to uh, Greg Abbott regarding um the pandemic. And this is coming at a time when we're seeing signs of a second wave uh, now that both Texas and other states are are opening up their economies again. We're starting to see the numbers go up. I think on Saturday we had the biggest single day uh, uh, right. n- number uh, of new infections, uh, I think 230 you know, in a mm-hmm. one day period. So um, what, what did Nelson Wolf uh, have to say to Greg Abbott about this? Yeah. You know, you know 
what what Nelson Wolf was saying was like, look, we need to be able to require uh, people to wear masks. Um, that was something that he was he was very unhappy with uh, when you know Governor Abbott came out and said, look, like we're not going to have criminal penalties for or, or criminal or civil penalties for not wearing masks. And, you know, that was something that, you know, Nelson Wolf was, was, you know, not happy with at all. It was, it was, it was kind of his main criticism of, of the governor at at this point. And, you know, he sends this letter basically asking for, you know, the county's ability to basically do that. And, you know, the governor comes back and says, look, like, you know, you think that you can do this through, you know, sort of enforcement measures, but, you know, it's really just up to people, mm-hmm. you know, to, to decide whether they're going to, uh, whether they're going to actually wear the mask. Like yeah. it's a personal responsibility thing, uh, which is kind of not how a pandemic works. You know, well, it's, I mean, I, I wonder, if, I wonder how many, how much of this would be enforced, even if it were required, I wonder, you know, I mean, I, uh, just a little personal anecdote. Unfortunately, I, I spent uh, much of Sunday at Ikea and there's a sign, <laughs> there's a sign up front that said, uh, everyone who can wear a mask mm. must wear a mask inside. And I would say probably about two thirds of, of the customers in their, you know, very rough estimate were wearing masks, but there were, there were, there were definitely a good portion of people who were not wearing masks, you know, despite that. Right. And I know that's different from, from enforcing it, uh, on a city level cause you're, you're inside of a business. But I, I think, uh, one argument that, that Ron and Nelson have made is that that, that makes it easier to, uh, to, you know, just to just to require people to wear masks overall, as if. Uh, I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think that because I, I I don't know if anyone was ever fined or jailed for not wearing a mask back when it was required. Well, well you can you can you know you can kind of look at how uh, the city and county enforced their stay at home orders and their restrictions on business to begin with, which was kind of not a whole lot in terms of enforcement. I mean, there there were very few citations that were that were issued uh relative to the amount of, right, of calls and personal, violations that they anyway it was basically like you know you would get like a code enforcement officer or somebody out there and they would say hey you're you're violating it in x y and z way and they would just the the business or whoever would just comply uh and so i mean it's it's not like there was like this huge crackdown before when some of these requirements were in place, like they were, right. they were so very lax difference? about it. They were very much about sort of like the thing that they kept saying was just like, educate, educate, educate. We don't want to just fine a bunch of people during yeah. the pandemic. So how much difference would it make if, if uh, it were required anyway? Um, That's I a think, good question. You know, I mean, because yeah. a- Abbott's already, Abbott's office is, re- is saying everyone should be wearing a mask. Um, and, yeah. and I mean, in, in these type of situations and, you know, uh, guidance and, and public communication is so important, but, um, yeah, I don't know if, if there's no enforcement, I don't know. I don't know how much of a difference. Yeah, it's a really good question. Made. What do you think about that, Greg? I mean, do you think that, that having it ma- be mandatory would make, uh, made a difference before? No, I mean, I, I don't, I think, uh, I don't think anybody, or let me, let me check that. I think most people who wear masks out in public, do so because they think it stops the spread of the virus. I just don't, uh, I don't think there's much of an enforcement incentive at work here. I just don't think that people are thinking, uh, I could, I could be fined if, uh, if I, That's if right. I don't wear a mask, there was a long period though, where, I mean, you know, if you did go out in public, you know, at least, at least wherever I went, uh, everybody was wearing a mask. It was like, it was more like, uh, kind of a socially enforced thing. I mean, a peer, you know, a peer you, pressure. You thing. Be, yeah. You don't want to be the one dork not wearing a That's mask. Right. That's exactly like, right. In any given, any given dork. location, you know, and, but and, I mean, yeah. but it's like, you're, you're starting to see, um, you know, I, you know, whenever, you know, my girlfriend's going to get coffee, mm-hmm. you know, Lexi will text me like, I'm the only person here wearing a mask other than yeah. like the baristas. Other than that, like everybody is unmasked and these are kind of like 
you know, places that, that cater to sort of like, you know, I guess like younger, more affluent, um, so, sort of like hipster types. I don't know, man. Uh, but, th- but, but then like you go to the, but then you go to the, like the liquor store, like I'll go to a liquor store and like everybody will be wearing masks. It's, it's. Yeah, it's I actually, bizarre. I went, I went ax throwing Saturday night. And everybody in that action. Oh my God. Place. Did you take wow. video of that? <laughs> <laughs> I've got photos. Actually, yeah. One of my daughters uh, took some video. Anyway, we everybody. We have to a whole podcast to the axe throwing I thing. Know, yeah. No, listen. Listen, man. If you haven't gone axe throwing, go axe throwing. It's amazing. <laughs> I, actually, I actually broke an axe. But anyway. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah. It hit the ground. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a really bad throw. But anyway. <laughs> Like everybody around us, they were wearing masks. You know, I, I'm and wondering. You know, if, it, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was no. just going to say that that I think that 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 uh, Nelson Wolf is probably looking at it on a, in practical terms, saying that if we uh, if we're allowed to mandate it, just psychologically, for people who have started to relax about this whole thing, this is just a reminder. Hey, don't relax about it. And and how, how much of a difference that'll make, I don't know. But I think that's probably. Because yeah. he, I think he knows that that it's not like they're going to be going, going going around citing everybody. But there probably mm-hmm. is there probably is a psychological difference there. I, I would I would argue. You know, I think I, so many people. It just seems like they they're pretending like the pandemic is over. You know, and they got tired. Yeah, of yeah. I mean, I'm, like I'm really curious about. I mean, if if we're truly at the beginning of of a second spike. Like, is anybody talking about going back to more rigorous stay-at-home orders? Like, I, it seems like it's been weeks since I've heard essential yeah. and non-essential businesses. I mean, is that going to yeah. come back yeah. at all? Do you think? I, mean, I don't I think mean, so. I, I think I think what it's going to take is like a New York-style meltdown of of the hospital system. I mean, mm. personally, I mean, I know that's pe- pessimistic, but but I mean, w- once we start going over capacity in, in right. the hospital. Well, I mean, that seems to be what what Governor Abbott is is hanging his hat on, right? I mean, it's you know, when asked, didn't he talk about hospital uh, capacity and the fact mm-hmm. that Texas has plenty of it in terms of you know the second spike and whatever restrictions may be coming down the pike or or, or probably are not coming down the pike. Sure, but yeah. I mean, the thing that the thing that strikes me is that, is that in reopening, he he ignored the white house guidance yeah. on a, a sustained 14 day period of, you know, a, a drop in new cases. So. And yeah, ignored I, a lot of the guidance of his own health officials that yeah. he yeah. put in place. And, and the last yeah. thing is, I, I would just want to say that, you know, that this is really the, the latest in a long line of conflicts that we've seen uh, between Greg Abbott and local officials in Bear County and elsewhere. And the issue of local control, which is, I, th- I think been one of the, you know, kind of the fascinating running stories of his of his time as governor, than that he has continually sort of uh, uh, you know superseded or tried to to stand in the way of of local communities having control. And basically, you know, Nelson Wolf isn't saying I want you to mandate it. He's just saying give us the power to mandate it in our own community if we want to. And and Abbott doesn't want to do that. So um, I think well, we're going to end it on that note. Him. I'm sorry. What were we going to say? I just said he's got to own the consequences then. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, we're gonna. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you all for listening, and we'll catch up with you next week. Take care.